see Christ in the context of the fall and the great redemptive plan planned by the Father for our salvation. Now, in this great redemptive plan, and actually we're dealing more than with this earth, we're dealing with uh, many worlds which Christ creates, and for some reason he comes here to this earth, this little speck, uh, out on one of the arms of the great Milky Way galaxy to make an atonement, to redeem all that the Father centered in him and created by him. And the prophet Joseph Smith taught that in the final analysis, this earth in its redemptive power and program will stand next to Kolob in the great Kolob system, the great stellar system of Kolob. Now why that is, we do know that Christ's mission has a greater context than just his life in uh, and around Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Galilee, and so forth. See, he's the center of a great cosmic program, and that cosmic program is concerned with the creation, the fall, and the redemption of this earth, and also of other earths. So that, as the Apostle Paul puts it, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And as the prophet Joseph Smith once said, this earth shall be rolled back into the presence of God and crowned with celestial glory. Now, to roll it back into the presence of God means that it was once there, and it was in creation. And then it fell. And then the great plan of redemption is to bring it back. And that plan of redemption centers in that one lone soul individual, Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One. And uh, that whole picture then finally focuses on the condescension of God, the fact that he would send his only begotten, and that in doing so, that he would plant in him the powers of life necessary to redeem the whole order of things that he created. Now, I don't know whether you can think big enough to think then of the meaning of Christ. Now, it's in that sense then that I'd like to develop some of the Book of Mormon contributions on Christ as the great creator of all things. Mosiah 3 and 8, for instance, uh, King Benjamin points out that he is the creator of all things from the beginning, and he uses that word rather soon. And that comes out also in Helaman's testimony of Samuel the Lamanite. And it's also a relationship. He is the father of heaven and earth and all things which in them are. Now you think of that for a minute. There's different ways in which we use the term father. A person may be a father of five children. Another person may be a father of an institution which he creates. George Washington is the father of our country. <clears throat> James Madison is called the father of the Constitution. And in that sense, there's, there's a begetting process involved, is there not? Now, Jesus is referred to as the Father of heaven and earth and all things which in them are. And that includes the bugs and the bees and the, and the nits and the fleas. Okay? Now, for example, let me turn with you to Alma 11. Now, in Alma 11, we have an account of the exchange of, of Amulek with this lawyer whose name is Zizram. Uh, the Nephites at that time were plagued with the lawyer cult. And I don't mean to cast any dispersions, but we're getting pretty close to that. You can't do business today without one of them. And uh, so lawyers then are 
a part then of society. Uh, pardon, I just got to tell you this one. <clears throat> you know, over in California, they're using lawyers in place of rats and mice for experimental purposes. <clears throat> Now, the one, one, three or four reasons for that. One is that they're more numerous. <laughs> and the other is that the technicians don't get so greatly attached to them. <laughs> and the third reason is that they'll do things that the rats and the mice won't do. <laughs> All right, now, <clears throat> Amulet is focused in on this lawyer situation, and the chief shyster among them is a fellow by the name of Zizram. And he wants to put Amulek on the witness stand and give him the Perry Mason theme. And finally, Amulek consents. And I'd like to have you study this out now, because there's some important messages here. Beginning now with verse 26 of Alma 11, the Zizram said unto him, Thou sayest there is a true and living God. And Amulek said, Yea, there is a true and living God. Now that's his answer. Now Zizram said, Is there more than one God? Now what would you answer? Think about it now. Amulek says, no. Now that immediately raises some questions in your mind. No, there's only one. Now Zizram said unto him, How knowest thou these things? And Amulek said, An angel hath made them known unto me. Now if that was a good angel, then that's a good answer. Of course it might be a bad angel. But it was a good angel, and it's a good answer. And then Zizram said again, Who is he that shall come? Is it the Son of God? And he said unto him, Yea. And then Zizram wants to know if Jesus is good enough to save us in our sins. And Amulek backs off on that and says, You can't do that. Well, they get through that hassling of saving in or from your sins, and then in verse 39, it says, And Amulek said unto him, now let's go back to 38, Zizram said again unto him, Is the Son of God the very eternal Father? Now you think about that one. Is the Son of God the very eternal Father? And Amulek said, Yea, he is the very eternal Father of heaven and of earth and all things which in them are. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and he shall come into the world to redeem his people. Now, can you make sense of all of that? And can you reconcile that exchange and the views expressed in it with some of the views that we've got? Can you? You know, the prophet said, the Father has a body of flesh and bones, as tangible as man, the Son also, Holy Ghost is a person, his spirit, and there are three gods. And uh, yet uh, Amulek says now there's only one. Now that's not a contradiction. Strange as it may seem, it's not a contradiction. Uh, some people have the idea of what I call a great first presidency in the sky. Now, I, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but I want you to get the idea. And that is that here's the Father, and here's Christ, and here's the Holy Ghost. If you got your Yerman Thummim, you can read that. And they constitute a great presidency. And uh, the Father delegates some responsibilities to first counselor. He makes the atonement. 
he does some things. The Father delegates some other things to the Holy Ghost, second counselor, and he does some things, fulfills some purposes and missions. And the whole of this thing, then, is what we focus our theology in and the operations of these three beings with the Father sitting there counseling his two counselors. Now, that's the great first presidency in the sky. And it's not true. It simply isn't true. Now, let me give you the correct view. The correct view still uses the three persons. It still makes our Father in Heaven primary, but uh, there are some different relationships involved. You have the Father, and then under the Father you have Christ. And then this indwelling relationship where Christ receives the fullness of the glory centers in him so that not only does Christ have authority in the sense of divine investiture of authority, but through the divine nature, the spirit, the glory, the power, the Father dwells in Christ, not physically, but in the sense of intelligence and glory and mind. And Jesus so loves the Father that he unites himself and subordinates his will to the man of holiness and is thereby able to use that indwelling spirit and glory and to articulate the words of the Father and to express the truths and to become the perfect revelation, manifestation of the Father. And in that sense, then, he becomes the Father and the Son. In that relationship, now can you see that? Are we as clear as mud on that one? All right, now, where does the Holy Ghost fit? Let me turn to John chapter 16 with you. And let's get the picture of the Holy Ghost in here. The Savior is here talking to his disciples about uh, that person whom we call the Holy Ghost and his promise now to give or to send him, give him or send him. And he says this beginning with verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, that's one of his names, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. All right, so the Holy Ghost isn't going to go out and do his own little private thing. Now he goes on and says this, and this is very important, verse 14. He, the Holy Ghost, shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. Now, where does the Holy Ghost get his power? From Christ or from the man of holiness? He gets it from Christ. Now, is the Holy Ghost second counselor and Jesus first then? Hardly. Okay? All right, and then he says this, the Savior, explaining, All things that the Father hath are mine. Now, there, in an ultimate sense, is only one God. It's the Father. All the powers of deity, all the truth, and all the program is there. He honors his son by naming the plan after him because Jesus puts it into operation. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is the plan of the man of holiness, is it not? And Jesus came only to do that which his father sent him. And so he is primary, but he has given all things to Christ. All things that the Father hath are mine, Jesus said. Therefore, speaking of this fact in relation to the Holy Ghost, therefore said I that he, the Holy Ghost, shall take of mine, on that basis, he will take of mine and shew it unto you. And so where does the Holy Ghost fit in then? He's a subordinate person down here. Okay? Now that's... Uh, not a first, second counselor relationship, is it? Now, in that relationship, let me just develop this idea of the Holy Ghost a little bit further and show you the Book of Mormon contribution on that. 
Uh, let's turn first of all, though, to section 36 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is a revelation given to Edward Partridge. Now, who was Edward Partridge? Well, he was a gentleman who lived in the Kirtland area, and he was a good friend of Sidney Rigdon prior to the coming of the gospel to the Kirtland people. And as the gospel came to the Kirtland people, by and through what we call the Lamanite mission, Oliver Cowdery and Parley P. Pratt and Richard Ziba Peterson and Peter Whitmer, Jr., and so forth, as the gospel came then there, these people were converted. Sidney Rigdon was converted and baptized, and Edward Partridge was converted but hadn't yet been baptized. But they wanted to know about this new thing. And so while the Lamanite mission went on down to Jackson County, Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partridge went to Fayette, New York. And when they got there, the Lord gave a revelation to Sidney Rigdon, now found in section 35 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then in section 36, he gives one to this non-member as yet by the name of Edward Partridge. Now note how he begins this revelation. Thus saith the Lord God. Note he's not saying, Thus saith elder brother. Thus saith the Lord God, the mighty one of Israel. Behold, I say unto you, my servant Edward, that you are blessed and your sins are forgiven you, and you are called to preach my gospel as with the voice of a trump. Now he's talking to a non member. And he says, And I will lay my hand upon you by the hand of my servant Sidney Rigdon. Now, Sidney Rigdon was baptized and ordained an elder. And he's talking about Edward Partridge's confirmation to be a member of the church. I will lay my hand upon you by the hand of my servant Sidney Rigdon, and you shall receive, and note this now, you shall receive my spirit, the Holy Ghost, even the Comforter. Now, whose spirit was he going to get by the laying on of hands? Christ's Spirit, the Holy Ghost, or the Comforter. Can you see that? Now, in Nephi, in, in Moroni, rather, chapter 10, you've got a thousand years of Nephite history and Nephite gospel and doctrine uh, just boiled down and compacted into a final great testimony. One of the great chapters of the Book of Mormon is Nephi 10, or Moroni 10, pardon in Moroni 10, he starts out, and we all know how this is, what this means, he starts out with giving us the formula to get a testimony of the Book of Mormon. That's Moroni 10 and 4. Anyone doesn't know Moroni 10 and 4, that's how to get a testimony. And then what's Moroni 10 and 5 all about? He says, hey, don't stop with Moroni 10 and 4. That's only how to get a testimony. Moroni 10 and 5, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can know the truth of all things. If you hear something here today and you don't know whether it's true, don't get riled. What do you do? Go ask the Lord, just like you did when someone presented the Book of Mormon to you. Right? It's the, it's the role of a teacher to stretch minds. It's the role of the teacher to break down barriers. It's the role of a teacher to expand and sometimes literally to bowl you over. That's the role. Now, some teachers use that and then end up teaching something contrary to the truth. But a true teacher then will teach you something maybe you didn't hear before or know before. And then what's your challenge? Go to Moroni 10 and 5. Go home and pray about it. Study about it. I've had some things where it's first been presented to me and even where the Spirit of the Lord presented to me. Honest. I said, hey, Lord, I just don't know about that. Now, I've had that experience where I've just said, Wow, Lord, I just don't know about that. I'm going to have to hang on to that a little while. And then I go study it and pray about it, and I say, Thanks, Lord, for your extreme mercy. Wow! I'm glad I got over that one, and I'm glad I got expanded a little bit, see? All right, so Moroni 10 and 5. Then after Moroni 10 and 5, then he delineates the spiritual gifts which should belong to the church. And after he talks about the spiritual gifts, and we call these gifts of the Holy Ghost, don't we? Isn't that what 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 does? Calls them gifts of the Holy Ghost. 
and also DNC 46, where you got another list of them. All right, he uses these gifts, and they're called gifts of the Holy Ghost. But how does the Book of Mormon call them? Read verse 17. And all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ, and they come unto every man severally according to his will. Now, is that a contradiction with calling them the gifts of the Holy Ghost? No, it isn't. Why? Because the Holy Ghost gets his truth and power, his gifts from Christ. You see that? And in the Book of Mormon, you've got a special focus on Christ. The title page that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself into all nations. See, not just the Son of God now, the eternal God. And in the sense now of the Father's appointments, in the sense that the Father has given all things to center in Christ, in that this person is, is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. He's the beginning and the end. Now, what's outside the beginning and the end? Nothing. Everything centers in Christ, right? How many gods are there then? For us now in this fallen state, unredeemed, and in the process of redemption, how many gods are there? And the answer is one. And who is he? Christ, the Father, and the Son. Now, that's the Book of Mormon doctrine. And what relation does the Holy Ghost have to it? He's subordinate to Christ. He takes of Christ and manifests it to us. Now, can you get that picture from the Book of Mormon? Study it over, because that testimony is taught over and over and over again. All right, now, Christ, then, is the great creator, and since all things have been centered by the Father in him, He's the Father of heaven and earth and of all things which in them are. Now, over in Job chapter 32, verse 8, we have Job saying there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of God giveth him understanding. Now, as I dissect that statement, it says to me that there's three principles there. There's the organized human spirit with its central primal intelligence, and we call that one. And then there's man with a reference now to the physical organism, and uh, that's the second. And then it says, and the inspiration of God giveth him understanding. Now that's a third principle, see. As I read the first chapter of the book of John, uh, John testifies that Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. All right, so that within me, for example, there are three principles of life. There's an organized spirit. This is old, broken-down frame that I've got that can't run as fast as it used to. Uh, that's the second principle. And then there's this indwelling, quickening principle of life. Now, I get my spirit body from the man of holiness. He's my father in that sense. I get my physical father from my, I mean, physical body, from my physical father, right? And he's the source and giver of that, right? And my mother. All right, now, there's this quickening principle of life by which I live and move and have a being, to quote Paul's statement on Mars Hill to the Athenians, okay? And uh, who's the father of that? Christ. You see that? He's the great creator of all things. And he's the father of heaven and of earth and of all things which them in them are. Now, that includes the bedbugs and the fleas. So be reverent to those little rascals, will you? <coughs> They've got a great father. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> now, in that sense, then, everything on earth is not only created but has a father-son, or so as it is, relationship with Christ. Now, when you get to the doctrine of rebirth, the new birth, uh, and you enter into the newness of life that leads to eternal life, then you turn that basic rheostat up, you see, through the ordinances of the gospel, through faith in Christ, and through the ordinances and the laying on of hands, and the baptism of fire, and so forth. You, re you turn that rheostat up, and then on a higher level, then Christ becomes your father, see? 
And that's only the beginning of a succession of steps that go on up above that. Okay? All right, so Christ then is the Father of heaven and earth. And when it comes to the creation then, he created the earth. He created this earth. He did so as the great executive of the man of holiness. And uh, he had the intelligence and the understanding to bring it into being and to give it form and organization and to place life upon it. And in that sense then he played the role of the great creator and then because he extends his spirit, glory, and power, then he is the father of heaven and earth and of all things which in them are. Now when the earth was created, in what state was it? We need, we need to recognize this and see what the Book of Mormon teaches on the subject. We've got so many ideas loose in the world in relation to the origins of life that are almost taken uh, just to, without qualification, that have no foundation in truth, and uh, that need to be understood, and we need to see things in relation to the gospel, and then uh, hopefully take it from there and reconcile things in relation to Christ, not on the basis of making Christ compatible with man-made theory. But let me turn, for example, to 2 Nephi chapter 2. Now here is uh, uh, Lehi speaking, and his information, as you study it out, he apparently gets from the brass plates of Laban, which contain an account of the creation, and uh, probably with some more details to it and some more insights to creation than we have in, in the King James Bible. Now he's talking about the situation of Adam, if he did not, uh, had he not partaken of the, of the forbidden fruit. He's talking about the situation of Adam before the fall. And note what he says. And now, verse, verse 22, And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen. But he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. And they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Now let me just analyze that a minute with you. Uh, all things which were created must remain in the same state. How broad and inclusive is the word all? Some people have the idea that in the Garden of Eden you had one state of, situ of, of life and outside of the Garden another one. Now, what does Lehi think about it? All things which were created were in the same state. Right? Granted, there was a garden. Granted, you had uh, uh, the residence, and you had the extra beauty that uh, goes with the, the, the decoration of the garden and all of that. But the whole earth essentially was in the same general condition. Now, what does it mean that they were all, they, that had it not been for the, the creation, all the, the transgression, all things would have remained in the same state? What does the word state mean? Sometimes when you got a little time, take a concordance, Reynolds' concordance of the Book of Mormon, and just look under the word state, and then go and study every passage where that word is used and see what it says. Now for myself, I, I don't read the Book of Mormon from beginning to end very often. I don't think I've read it from beginning to end more than four or five times in my life. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, and I envy people who do do that, but the way I study it, the way I study it is like I've suggested. You go get Reynolds' Concordance and just follow every word and see what it means, see? And then you take that same word and go find it in all the other scriptures and see what has been revealed on a given idea, you see, and study it over and mull it over. 
Now, you can read it clear through and over and over again, and that's fine, and it, there's a certain benefit that you don't pick up this other way, but uh, studying the scriptures, I think, goes back to the, the old Jewish connotation. When you study the scriptures, you take a verse and you analyze every word, and then you analyze every word in relation to every other word, and then you define all the terms. And then you find out what those terms mean. And then you find out how those same terms have been used in other scriptures. And when you get through, you begin to see what the idea is. Now, for example, Alma talked about the state of the soul between death and the resurrection. What does the word state mean? It's the condition of life. The Book of Mormon says that this earth is in a fallen state. And it uses that word again. The Book of Mormon says it's a probationary state. The Book of Mormon says it's a carnal state. And not that a given individual is carnal, but that the order of things, it's a corrupt state. That's another expression in the Book of Mormon, see. And then that we're here to meet the challenges of this probationary state in order to prepare for a state of endless peace and rest in the presence of God, see. Now, the word state, then, means a condition or order of things. The law, the order, the system. Now, when Lehi says, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state, then he says that there is a, there's a law and a program and an order of life. And that order of life, there was no death in that order of life. And it would have stayed and continued and continued unless things were changed. And in that condition then, he says Adam and Eve would have had no children. Apparently they didn't have the power of procreation. And uh, he says, wherefore, they would have remained in the state of innocence, having no joy. Now the word joy, what does it mean scripturally? The joy of our redemption. Joy scripturally, when Lehi says man is that he might have joy, joy scripturally is what you have when you've been dipped into mortality in the fallen state, in the darkness and the trauma and the contradictions and the inconsistencies of the fallen state, and then through Christ come into his presence again and feel the truth and the power and the happiness that comes when you feel you're back home, you're back in your right mind, as it were, and you feel at peace and at one with your Father in heaven. See, that's joy, see. It's the joy of redemption. And it's not just going out and having a picnic. Uh, that's happiness and goodness and good things, but joy now has a much deeper connotation. All right, so. The earth then was in this state, and there was no death, and things would have continued in that order of things forever. The Adam and Eve scenario would still be going on today. There would still be a Garden of Eden in Jackson County, Missouri, and the whole earth would still be in the presence of God today, had there not been transgression. The state would never have changed. Now, that's what he's saying. <clears throat> All right, now, in that order of things then, uh, from that, certain questions come up. Over here in Alma chapter 12, uh, Alma is taking care of some of the, uh, it's Amulek, rather, is taking care of some of the questions that follow from his exchange with Zizram, the one that we just mentioned. and. Uh, uh, the question is asked here, beginning in verse 21, what does the scripture mean which saith that God placed cherubim and the flaming sword on the east of the Garden of Eden, lest our first parents should enter and partake of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever? And thus we see that there was no possible chance for them to live forever. See, uh, the question is, why this? And there's 
and there's no possibility to live forever, so why are you talking about eternity? Now Alma answered, and he says, this is the thing which I was about to explain. Now we see that Adam did fall by the partaking of the forbidden fruit, according to the word of God, and thus we see that by his fall all mankind became a lost and fallen people. Now there are not many of us believe that. Most of us are oriented in our image of ourselves by Western civilization. We read of uh, Western man, uh, clear back in the days of the Renaissance, going on from one great intellectual achievement after another to achieve liberty and achieve uh, the benefits of the scientific revolution and the great economic benefits of uh, the capitalist system and all of that, see. And uh, we look at ourselves now at the pinnacle, the very pinnacle of uh, an era that's brought us to walk on the moon and uh, conquer space and uh, to have an atomic age to discover the secrets of the atom with the hope that maybe we can use them to foster the kind of life that we want, which isn't for many people in America these days too Christian. But we, we have this mental attitude of great big Western man, right? And we're kind of oriented toward that. Now the Book of Mormon kind of pours a little water on that one. Now it doesn't uh, deny the achievements of the West. It talks about a mighty Gentile nation. It does make it clear that the Lord is at the root of that development, and he is. I've been spending the last eight years from five o'clock every morning for six days a week until the walls begin to fade in and out on me in the afternoon. Day after day after day for eight years on the origins of the Constitution. Haven't given birth to anything yet. I'm going to get something and abandon it to the publishers one of these times. But I can tell you in all humility and sobriety that Christ is the source of our liberty. And that degree of the Holy Spirit which those early founders and their predecessors achieved. That and Christ is the basis of our liberty. See? And so the great big uh, humanistic Western image of great Western man simply is a fabrication. It is a literal fabrication. And so this idea of how great we are in that sense is, is out of line. We need the Book of Mormon. Oh, how great says the Book of Mormon is the nothingness of man. And as Amulek put it, they became a lost and a fallen people. Now that's not Calvinism. That's not the doctrine of human depravity. That man has no virtue in him and he can't do any good. Now that's not that. But it is a doctrine that's realistic that tells us in this life we are in the midst of a battlefield. We, we land in mortality with both feet in the midst of a battlefield. And unless we turn to Christ, we have no chance to survive. We're like being on the reverse unit of an escalator. Because all you have to do is stand there and you'll go down. If you just stand there, don't exercise your faith. And so the great challenge then is to be on that reverse unit and moving down into darkness, distortion, dissipation, you name it, and then look up and see the hope of Christ and the power of his Spirit and have the necessary faith now to reach up and to counter that downward move and overcome the adversities of the world, be changed, transformed, become new creatures in Christ and finally come back even like the brother of Jared into God's presence or the next step up is in. See, now we're in the midst of a battlefield and looking at it from the mortal standpoint then we are a lost and a fallen people. Without Christ there would be no resurrection as we said this morning. Without Christ if you were to die your spirit then would be dominated by Lucifer. There would be no influence of the Holy Spirit or the light of Christ in your life, and under that kind of a situation, you would die as unto things of righteousness, to use the Book of Mormon expression. 
and you would eventually become a devil, and you would have no more desires for righteousness than Lucifer himself. And that means then that when we come to mortality, we are a lost and a fallen people. And the Book of Mormon teaches that clearly. And we need to know, and our young people need to know, that they've got to learn to fight the battle of faith in Christ. They've got to get over that he's just an elder brother patting them on the back. He is their Lord and their God. He can become their father. They can grow up to be like him. All that he did in the way of power and truth, they can do. He says, the works that I do, ye shall do also, because I go unto my father. Because he went through the father and made the atonement, then the time can come, if not here in eternity, when I can do greater things than Jesus did, because he becomes my father and I can grow up to be like him. Now that's the concept of the Book of Mormon, see? But realize that we are a lost and fallen people and we've got to meet that battle and that challenge. All right, so as he said, we come lost and the fallen people and he goes on and says, Now behold, I say unto you, that if it had been possible for Adam to have partaken of the fruit of the tree of life, at that time there would have been no death. Now Adam would have fallen, he would have been out of God's presence, but the action of the tree of life would have countered the action of the forbidden fruit, and he would have lived forever out of God's presence, or as we sometimes said, he would have lived forever in his sins. You see that? And so what did the Lord do? He sent cherubim, guard the way of the tree of life. Eventually the tree of life was literally taken from the earth, and it will be restored one day, and the righteous will be able to partake of it, but it was taken from the earth. And uh, that is a part of this great probationary state that he goes on and speaks about. And uh, in that sense, then, he talks about, and I won't take time to read the rest of Alma 12, but let me suggest that you do so to get that picture as he gives it to you in relation to the fall. Now, let's move on. The fall, actually, there's a, is a two-stage process, and we need to recognize that so you don't blame everything on Adam. Uh, let me turn to the fifth chapter of the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. This is the account of the introduction of the gospel into this, into this world. And uh, Adam and Eve then beget sons and daughters. They in turn married. Adam began and achieved the status of grandfatherhood. And all that way along the line, he had been given the law of sacrifice, which he diligently obeyed. And then one day an angel came to him and said, Now, why do you do this, Adam? And he says, I know not, except the Lord my God has commanded me. And then the angel say, said, And this is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father who is full of grace and truth. This is patterned after that, see. Now you do what look forward to Christ. He is the life and the light of the world. He's your Redeemer. He's going to become your Father also as you go through the processes of rebirth. See? Now, as Adam heard that, Mother Eve was listening by as a dutiful wife. And uh, she apparently got some tremendous insights. You have to have great respect for Mother Eve. It says, Eve, his wife, heard all these things and was glad, saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, we wouldn't have had any kids, and never should have known good and evil, and the joy of our redemption. Now, what's joy to her? It's the joy of redemption. It's the joy of having fallen and then feeling the powers of the Spirit through Christ and the witness of redemption and the truth and power that comes, that's the joy of redemption, see? And the eternal life which God giveth unto the, unto the obedient. All right, now Adam and Eve joyfully, they went to their kids and hold a hell of family home evening. And they told all of these things to their kids. Now this was before Cain and Abel were born. And uh, meantime then Satan, right, Johnny on the spot as he is, began to do his thing. And it says in verse 13, and, Cain, and Satan came among them, saying, I am also a son of God, 
And he commanded them, saying, Believe it not. And they believed it not, and they loved Satan more than God. Now that's Adam's first batch of kids. Now note, though, the, answer, the next statement. And men began from that time forth to be carnal, sensual, and devilish. Now did the fall make them carnal, sensual, and devilish? No. What did the fall do? Got them out of the presence. If there's carnality, is that the responsibility of Adam? The answer is no. If there's any carnality in our lives, we better look in the mirror. You see that? Because the fall just takes us out of the presence, and it's when we then love Satan. And some people, I've, I've loved Satan more than the Lord, and so have you, if you'll be honest about it. When you come down to a situation that you know darn well is wrong, and the adrenaline starts to flow, and the vanity starts to flow, or whatever, and you finally begin to go through the rationalizing process, and you finally put your hand behind you, the hand of reason and sanity, and you go ahead and act on the impulse of emotion, whatever kind it may be, you choose to love Satan at that point more than God, and you've done it, and I've done it. And it's a great challenge to meet the thing right at that point. The Lord's been very, very good to me. As a young boy, he gave me a, a special and select gift of the Spirit. It's called the gift of the knowledge of the Word. And ever since I've been a kid, as I used to sit on an Idaho farm on the ditch bank, letting the water run wild while I was reading Key to Theology, <coughs> or some other church record book, which my dad says he didn't think I could understand, and that was just a challenge to me. Ever since then, as I've read the scriptures, it just seems at times that the neon lamps turn on. And the witness of the Spirit says, this is what it means. And then I've gone to good people, good faithful brethren, even members of the College of Religion, where I used to be affiliated, and say, hey, let me tell you what I found. I've had a wild experience, a eureka experience. They look at it and say, I don't see that. And that's true, they don't. But the Lord has given me a kind of a gift. And the greatest challenge that has I've had is, Lord, shut the darn thing off. Why? Because meeting this challenge of wrestling with the fallen state and knowing with some sincerity of heart that you're really not measuring up to what you know. And then the, the flow just still goes on, the light still goes on, and you're just not cutting it, you're just not hacking it, you're just, you're just not really there where you know you ought to be. And some of the most desperate prayers I've ever prayed is, Lord, I simply can't handle it. And then I come around on the second kind of prayer and says, Lord, thanks for the gift. Please give me some strength. Please help me to meet the challenge like I will meet it. Now that's the fallen state, see. That's the fallen, and we all go through that. And if you're not, don't admit it, you're dishonest, really, I think. If you don't admit it, but you can't run away from it, you finally have to drop to your knees and find, find a sacred place. And I used to, as a kid on the farm, have an old briar patch. You couldn't get in there except by a little narrow path, and that was my sacred grove. I'd go in there and wrestle with the Lord and pray for strength. Now that's the kind of thing we're talking about, see? So we're in a fallen state, and that fallen state is a two-stage state. Adam put us in the fall, and we then put ourselves in a condition of being carnal, devilish, and so forth, see. And that's the situation. All right, now, in this whole situation then where, where uh, the benefits then of uh, mortal life are coupled with the challenges, the trials, the exigencies, the trauma of contradiction and the forces within ourselves. I think it was Peanuts or else Pogo who says, 
we've met the enemy and he's us. <laughs> Uh, I think that's so appropriate, see. As you, as you see that, then you begin to understand the doctrine of the fall and of the gospel plan as revealed in the Book of Mormon. For example, here's that great noble saint, King Benjamin. And he gets his text from an angel of the Lord and then takes it to his people and delivers it the next day. And as he does, then he teaches them some sacred truths that we all need to know. Here in Mosiah chapter 3, verse 18, beginning two or three lines down from the beginning of the verse. Men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children and believe that salvation was and is and is to come in and through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ or the Lord Omnipotent. Now, what do men do? You just have to stand there, and it happens. You drink damnation to your own souls unless you do something positive. If you just stand there, you drink damnation. You don't have to do anything. Just be a good guy or a good person, see? You drink damnation to your own souls unless you humble yourself and become as little children and believe, and note Christ again is the center, this is Helen May said in the great vision of Nephi, believe then that salvation was and is and is to come in and through the blood of Christ, the Lord omnipotent. And then he adds for, and that word for is a transitional conjunction, for the natural man, the person who's acclimated to this fallen state, is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atoning atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child submissive, meek, and humble, and so forth. See? You know, we sing this little song, and Brother Reed Nibley's a great friend of mine and a great guy who wrote it, I am a child of God. And that's a beautiful, and that's, I just love that little song. But we need to have another song. That song is oriented about being children of our Father in Heaven, the man of holiness, isn't it? Now, what happens to us merely as children of our Father in Heaven? <laughs> we come down here under the earth under the power of the fall. And if you're a natural person, you're an enemy to God. Now, do you, does an enemy to God any family privileges? Can you claim the blessings of being a son of our Father in heaven if you're a natural man? What does Jacob say is the end result without Christ? What does he say? The body would lay down to Mother Earth and rise no more, and what would happen to the spirit, as we've said three or four times? It would deteriorate in righteousness and become a devil, right? Now, that's what would happen if we were just children of our Father in heaven and nothing else. And so we need to write another song about becoming sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Now, if any of you are talented, do that. And make it as appealing as this other, because it's only when you come to the Father who loves you dearly through Christ that you can then put off the natural man where you're an enemy, where a son and a noble daughter now becomes an enemy. Only through Christ, then, can you put off the natural man and become a saint through the powers of the Spirit. Can you see that? And so focus your attention, just like as we've said here, the Father planted everything in Christ. This person right here is the primary person. He is our Lord. He is our God. He becomes our Father. Does that, does that nullify all of this? No. We just recognize the appointment of the Father. The appointment of the Father is 